Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us in this discussion about uh, AK Party, AK Party, Justice and Development Party in Turkey. It has been. It was founded 19 years ago. It has been almost two decades that the AK Party governments uh, have been in power under the leadership of President Erdogan. Uh, this week, in that sense, is, is special for the party. Um, as you all know, uh, it has had many um, sort of uh, electoral successes, uh, many of them, and then successes in referenda, being able to uh, gather support from the Turkish public on a variety of issues, including constitutional reforms. Of course, before I say too much, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, my great panel. Uh, there, are, there aren't many more qualified people than uh, the, this uh, set of speakers to discuss uh, the AK Party, AK Party's history, what it has stood for and what it has accomplished and what the challenges have been. Uh, so we are very privileged to have uh, Ravza Kavakçı Khan, uh, she's a current member of parliament from AK party. Um, and then we also have uh, Talib Küçükcan. Uh, he's currently with Marmara University, he's a post professor of uh, sociology, but he's also a former member of AK party. And then we have Hüseyin Alptekin, he is with the Sita Foundation in Istanbul. Um, He's with the strategy department there. Uh, they, they all have extensive resumes. I'm not gonna read them, uh, but I wanna turn to our discussion uh, about um, the AK party's 19 years. Uh, it is, as in Turkish, there is a saying that it is easy to say it, but uh, to understand it, to comprehend it, it's a whole other matter. So uh, before, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Khan uh, Ravza Kavakshi and and ask her about uh, AK Party. Uh, these how she sees AK Party's evolution over the past two decades, what the party stood for, and what it stands for today, and how she sees it, how she has experienced it, and what the challenges she sees ahead as well. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Khan, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish uh, a good afternoon to those in the United States or the East Coast and good evening to those who are joining from Turkey and good day for everybody else. Uh, of course, uh, this is something that we can think about uh, within Turkey uh, domestically and also internationally. What has AK Party brought? to Turkey and also to international politics. So it's multi-aspect, uh, there are multi-aspects uh, that we need to talk about, many, many aspects. But as somebody who is old enough to remember how things were in Turkey, I grew up in 1980s when I was uh, at an age when, I, when we experienced the 1980 military coup. I remember Turkey of those days. I remember the Turkey when it was not uh, legal or it was not considered um, acceptable for people with different ethnic identities to express themselves when this wasn't allowed. So I remember the Turkey when uh, citizens weren't treated equally by the state. So uh, the state-citizen relationship was at a level where the state wasn't there to protect the citizen, but the state was there to keep the citizen in line, so to speak. So as a Turkish citizen, if you had different aspirations, if you didn't uh, abide by the, the rules of the ideal citizen, then you couldn't exist. You had to fit in that particular description of ideal citizen. So who wouldn't fit that description? A person who has Kurdish identity, somebody who has different religious beliefs, somebody who has, who is a Muslim and wants to practice Islam in their daily lives. So all of these things that we consider in Turkey, we have considered 
for many, many um, centuries, something that is the richness of our, of our, of our uh, nation, of, uh, of the Turkish Republic, uh, and what was the Ottoman Empire before that, all of a sudden became something that's not acceptable. So if you weren't fitting within the description of the perfect citizen, then you couldn't have a voice. So I, uh, there are many things that changed with AK Party. So a few, of course, this isn't, as you mentioned, um, Mr. Uston, it wasn't something that happened in one day. It was a process that took many, many years and it took a lot of fighting and struggling. But how did this take place? AK Party came out as a people's movement. So it was, we talk about different revolutions in history all over the world, but this was really something that was supported by the people. Uh, when President Erdogan came up uh, with the, with the, with the uh, together with his friends, with the ideas that established, the aspirations that established AK Party, he was very open, very transparent. Uh, so what did AK Party promise the first dates to the people, it promised better democracy. It promised them equal rights. It promised them uh, that they wouldn't have to be dealing with any kind of military interventions. So it, it had all these aspirations. And like I said, because it was open with the people, election after election, people kept supporting AK Party. And what changed if we were to fast forward from 2001 to today? Now, the idea of uh, the state that I grew up with, state was something for me that I should be afraid of. Uh, I needed to make sure that I uh, uh, obeyed the rules and the laws of the state, but that for me, for instance, as a, as a woman who wears the hijab and who, is a, who wants to to be an active, who wanted to be an active part of the Turkish society, I couldn't find a way to exist with my religious identity in the Turkish society. What do I mean to exist? To go to school, to go to university, to work uh, in a state or private institution. So all of these things for me has changed, but it's not just for me, it's for people who may have different ethnic identity like our Kurdish citizens, who weren't allowed to even say that they're Kurdish. They were forced uh, um, and, uh, to, to uh, forget about Kurdish identity or for our Alawite citizens or for our non-Muslim citizens. Uh, I remember meeting a lady who is, um, who is uh, um, an Armenian citizen, uh, Christian, she was telling me she was forced to pronounce her name as a Muslim name. Her name is Maria, but she said before AK Party, I used to say my name is Maryam because I wanted to get a job. But now she is able to exist as Maria. So the, these are just a few examples that I could think of, but all of these things are uh, what uh, was brought by AK Party. So for citizens, this, this, the relationship between citizen and state changed. State that was there to um, uh, police the citizen to make sure the citizens behave is now state that is there to ensure that citizens can fulfill all their rights. So as an individual, I feel like, okay, my state is there to serve me and uh, it is there to protect my rights, and I have rights. Uh, well, while previous generations used to think, okay, I have no rights, and uh, I hope the state doesn't crush my dreams or, my, or me physically, literally. So uh, this is what has changed with AK Party, but like I said at the beginning, it didn't happen in one day. It was a long process, it was a long fight, and uh, after 19 years, uh, we're at a position, uh, I don't want to speak like an old grandma, because, you know, women don't like to say their age, but yes, uh, I still can't believe the change. Of course, for young people who have grown up with this change, it's not a big deal, but I mean, when I was, when I was 
20 years ago when people told me things would change in Turkey and there would be people would be able to exist with their ethnic identities and would be respected or a woman like myself would be would be allowed to get service hospital in the hospitals or to serve in the in the state institutions leave alone being a member of the parliament i would tell them come on you're dreaming so this is a dream come true for a lot of people but should i finish i don't know how much time i have but uh, to, also in the international arena uh, when i was growing up i saw a turkey that was weak that wasn't independent now in the international arena i see a turkey that's strong that's an actor and uh, i serve as the president of turkish uh, group uh, to the interparliamentary union in the grand national assembly of turkey so when we go to the ipu general assemblies we see that everybody follows what turkey is saying and uh, they may like it they may not like it but uh, when uh, turkey is there with other nations other strong nations that argue that they're like superpowers uh, yes we get we get some attention and we see that uh, i give an example from 2000 um 13, I think, or just a few years ago, uh, not 2013, just a couple of years ago on the image with President Erdogan inviting uh, Merkel, Macron and Putin to talk about Syria. Uh, it was just two years ago. So it was 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so uh, this is something as a child, I could have never imagined happening with the leader of Turkish Republic. So we have, uh, of course, a part of it is, is the strong leadership, but what is behind the strong leadership is a strong, strong, um, strong volunteers base of AK Party and also people who support and who believe in, in the cause. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, something that's very, very uh, important to look into uh, when we're talking about AK Party. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan, um, for highlighting how that evolution happened and also, you know, this uh, uh, generational shift. It's been two decades, of course, uh, but um, that we are kind of from the same generation. So those changes have been truly uh, drastic, let's say. Uh, but we'll come to, the, to discussing a bit more in detail uh, about various issues you mentioned, both the sort of religious identity and ethnic identity as well. So I want to just turn to Dr. Kichukchan uh, for his take on this uh, story of the past two decades. Please. Well, thank you, Kadir. It's a pleasure to join you, and I would like to thank all other participants as well for uh, listening to us and also probably being able to contribute to the discussion later on. But I think I am the oldest among the uh, speakers, so I can, uh, I am the eyewitness to many changes and transformations that, that uh, Turkey has gone through. As a party of transition, a party of transformation. If you look at the literature of Turkey today, there are two concepts that are frequently used the old Turkey and the new Turkey. And Ravza has described, I think, partly the old Turkey and the new Turkey. Uh, if you look at the title of the party, it's called Justice and Development Party. You asked in the beginning what it stands for. I think it stands for justice for all, not only for the majority, not only for the people who are at the center or who were at the center at the time, uh, 19 years ago, and also the development. Uh, I think this is something also we should uh, uh, focus our attention as well. Um, if you look at the um, support base of the AK Party, it has steadily increased. It has started in 2002 as 34%. AK Party received only 34% of the votes in 2002 election. Since then, in every local elections and on, uh, in uh, national elections, we have seen a gradual uh, increase in the support base of the party across ideological divisions, across religious ethnic uh, uh, belongings. Uh, and it has reached up to 49%. Uh, 
uh, of course, one should look at the reasons behind the increase of such electoral support. Uh, one reason is the development that we have seen in Turkey, the infrastructure. If you look at the education status of uh, uh, education, if you look at the quality of the education, for example, you will find that there is an access to education for all, not only in the uh, urban areas, but also in the rural areas. People can go to school, people can get support from the government. Uh, and if you look at the teachers, I just would like to share uh, you know, very simple information with you. Uh, when Akbari came to power, the Turkish Republic was 79 years old. And in 79 years time, the governments appointed almost half a million uh, teachers for the whole nation. In 18 years time, Ak Parti has actually appointed more than 600,000, more than 79 years uh, of uh, uh, Republican history. You can see the investment in people, investment in the country. I think that has played a lot of role in addition to, of course, democratization issues that we will come to that. And if you look at the health services in Turkey, if you look at the hospitals, if you look at access to doctors, for example, I think there's a telling story these days, especially when it comes to how Turkey is uh, dealing with the challenges that are by the pandemic. Uh, and uh, everywhere in Turkey, people do have a free access to health services. They get medicine, they get uh, medical treatment. I think this is also something that AK Party has touched on the daily lives of people. Uh, of course, there are people, you know, when you talk to intellectuals, when you talk to educated people, when you talk to the people uh, in the bureaucracy, they will mention many things about the theoretical issues, like democracy, human rights, freedom of religion, secularism, etc., etc. This is one thing. But also we are talking about a nation of 83 million. So there are many people in the rural areas. There are many people who were poor, who suffered from poverty, for example. Therefore, when we look at how AK Party has transformed Turkey, there are two aspects of it. One is the state and its relation with the people, with citizens. I think Ravza has rightly touched on some of the issues there. And AK Party has changed the state status quo in Turkey in many ways. It recognized pluralism. It recognized the diversity within the country. This is one side of the story that you will see mostly in the, I think, Western media and Western uh, publications, but also when it comes to the, the uh, life of ordinary people in Turkey, people in the street, their lives have really changed a lot. Uh, and uh, one story is with Turkey's uh, negotiation with the European Union. Turkey has changed under the AK Party, although it has started before AK Party, but AK Party took on that mission and it has changed a lot of laws in Turkey, regulations, in order to, uh, let's say, increase the uh, quality of life in Turkey. And that has happened. This is also another reason why our party could be described as a party of transformation, as a party of, I think, transition. Therefore, we can see a transition from old Turkey to new Turkey uh, in, I think, two aspects. At least there are maybe more than that. One is the quality of democracy and human rights issues. The other one is the uh, infrastructure that is touching the daily lives of every, every uh, citizen in Turkey. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kichukcan. Uh, I wanted, I, I, it was very important that you underlined the state citizen relationship to how that trans, that's been transformed uh, over the past two decades, especially, and also uh, thank you for reminding us the the name of the party, right? But it, but the very uh, because those uh, words were not chosen uh, uh, just by happenstance, of course. Um, thank you for that, and I want to turn to Hussein. I'll take him for his take, please, Hussein. Go ahead. Thank you, Kadir, uh, and thank you for all our audience and other contributors here. And I think uh, I will take it from uh, where uh, Dr. Talib Kucukcan uh, left it, the transformative role of uh, the AK Party. And I want to uh, focus on a particular uh, demographic segment in the Turkish society, which is Turkey's Kurds. As a researcher who uh, makes research on uh, the Turkey's Kurdish question, this uh, 
was quite an area in terms of transformation, in terms of with uh, Ms. Ravza Kavakchahan's uh, statement, uh, the ideal citizens. So when we look at uh, the modern history of Turkey, uh, the Kurds of Turkey were probably uh, on the top of the list, which were uh, denied of their rights and uh, lacked recognition and couldn't uh, reproduce their own uh, cultural and ethnic uh, repertoire. And when we look at the AK Party years, uh, from the onset up until today, we can make a long list of uh, transformation in, in many domains of, of the daily lives of Kurds. Of course, uh, you can talk about economic rights, you can talk about you know, political participation, representation, but here, since our time is quite limited, I want to focus on the cultural aspect of the Kurds' daily lives in Turkey, which uh, basically uh, means or implies the Kurdish language, which was literally banned prior to 2002 when AK Party came to power. So after AK Party rose to power, we one by one saw that the Kurdish language uh, started to be practiced freely, not only you know, in private affairs of people, but also in formal institutional channels. And uh, here uh, to our audience, I want to make just a few reminders of what has changed in terms of the Kurdish language. So right one year after uh, AK Party came to power in Turkey, the first thing was uh, to remove the ban uh, on giving uh, newborns Kurdish names. So as you know, uh, Turks and Kurds in Turkey, of course, they share their names. We have common uh, you know, origin or cultural repertoire, but there are certain names which were uh, etymologically Kurdish and uh, they were literally banned before the AK Party years. And in 2003, in just one year, AK Party removed this ban uh, for giving you know, the newborn babies Kurdish names. And still this ban is removed and still it is practiced freely. And of course, not only personal names, but also the use of Kurdish names for certain locations in Turkey uh, has become also more and more common in the meantime. Uh, the other development in terms of the, you know, removing the barriers uh, for Kurdish language, uh, I think the most important one was the removal of uh, bans over broadcasting in Kurdish language. And further, in 2009, the state-owned uh, broadcasting agency, the TRT, started to operate a, a TV channel uh, exclusively in Kurdish language, in, in a number of Kurdish dialects, and still it is operating. Uh, its name was originally TRT Shesh, then uh, it became TRT Kurdi, and this state-owned uh, television channel uh, operates in Kurdish language, so which was uh, quite hard to imagine uh, in just our recent history. As uh, Mr. Ravza Kavakçı uh, uh, stated right before, uh, now, when we look at the situation, we cannot imagine where the Kurdish language might be prohibited, might be banned. But in just, I don't know, 19 years ago, that was our norm in our political life, in our daily life. Another important uh, progress or transformation in terms of uh, the Kurdish language and the Kurdish rights in Turkey was uh, the free education of Kurdish, Kurdish language. It started first uh, in the universities in 2009, uh, the Mardin Artuklu University uh, started uh, a, an institute of Kurdology, uh, Kurdology, Kurdology Institute. And uh, this institute started to teach uh, Kurdish classes at the uh, public university of uh, Mardin Artuklu University. And uh, they started to write a thesis in Kurdish language, which is still going on, by the way. There is no regression on that part. And it didn't remain limited to universities alone, but in just uh, five years after this first progress, uh, also the uh, lower level schools, uh, starting from the middle school, uh, the students start to take elective courses on Kurdish. Again, uh, that was totally absent in the entire 
Turkeys in the entire modern history of Turkey. So starting from 2013, it has become uh, a common uh, procedure, a common uh, education, a common class in Turkish public schools, uh, the offering of uh, Kurdish elective courses uh, to the middle school kids. And later on, such elective courses uh, got more and more coverage in terms of their uh, weekly hours, in terms of their uh, spread. So we can make a much longer list in terms of uh, what has changed uh, regarding the lives of Kurds in Turkey. But uh, the only reason why I gave this particular examples was that right now there is a false image of Turkey, especially in the Western public opinion, in the Western newspapers, think tanks, we might call them. And there is this kind of perception, in fact, misperception that the Kurds are losing their rights in Turkey. I keep coming across such a propaganda, but all these items that I just listed you, and the real list is much longer, but there is no single step backward from any of these reforms. The TRT Kurdu is still operating today, fully in Kurdish language. The Kurdology Institutes, or with their other name, the Living Language Institutes, are still teaching Kurdish classes. They are still offering Kurdish language theses. And also uh, the removal of bans for uh, newborn babies' names, uh, it's still remote. There's no go, uh, turn back toward these bans. So from that regard, all these rights which were denied uh, for Turkish Kurds over decades, for such a long time, they were all removed for the first time. Uh, during the AK Party era, and there is no way going back there. Right now, maybe there is only uh, one question about, you know, uh, the Turkey's Kurdish issue, and that might be the PKK problem. And over the decades, unfortunately, the PKK hijacked uh, Turkey's Kurdish question, and it has become almost inevitable to discuss the rights of Kurds in Turkey without mentioning the PKK. And uh, to be fair, the PKK did this quite uh, successfully from its own perspective. And from everywhere in the global think tanks, in the global media, it has become almost impossible to discuss Kurdish question without the PKK issue. But right now, I think the AK Party's course for the Kurdish question has become to separate these two paths. There is one path, the security domain, in which the Turkish security apparatus is struggling with the PKK terrorism. That's a whole different area. But on the other hand, there is the area where we can talk about rights and demands and politics, the civilian politics. The two are quite separate now. And right now, uh, sorry, it has become dark a little bit here. That's very bad timing, sorry for that. And I want to conclude with just this sentence that uh, the Kurds, for the first time in their history in Turkey, uh, achieved their rights during the AK Party era, and there's no way uh, to go back. Thank you, Hussein. Um, so I thank you for, I was gonna come to the Kurdish question with you. Uh, you, you delved into it, but of course we'll discuss that further, more in detail. I wanna turn to Dr. Kavakçı. Um, in Turkey, uh, uh, Dr. Kavakci, both religious rights, religious freedoms, and women's rights have been often have gone hand in hand. Um, you, you and your family is a is a proof of that. They gone through uh, many of these uh, events over the over the years that that where in Turkey the restrictions on religious freedoms uh, were were basically mostly uh, imposed upon uh, women as well. They're, they weren't allowed to uh, wear headscarves in, in public institutions, even at universities. You yourself have gone through that uh, those uh, times. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about, because that's important for, if you're looking at it from a women's rights perspective as well, that's very important and significant. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, what happened uh, in terms of uh, religious rights in Turkey and uh, 
and then perhaps you can reflect on i'm sure there is more room to imp room for improvement than how ak party is looking to the future uh, to do to accomplish what kind of measure they might be thinking about uh, to to implement thank you i think you're on mute sorry I was enjoying listening to Professor Kuchukjan and Dr. Aptekin, so I forgot to turn my mic on. Uh, thank you. I think um, listening to uh, the previous distinguished guests also uh, made me go back and think deeper about it. When we're talking about the modernization processes in general, a lot of uh, national modernization processes, the history has been based on women. Uh, or and a lot of symbolic things like cultural things like music like uh, like um, daily behavior like attire physical attire and uh, going back to the ideal citizen definition that i was talking about so this was a definition that was more of a secular citizen and when we talk about secularism we're not talking about american type of secularism although we were taught in elementary school back when I was going to elementary school 10,000 years ago, we were taught that secularism was a separation of religion and state affairs. However, in Turkey, the way it was applied was a, a fundamentalist secularism, uh, I would like to say, something that was borrowed by, from the French constitution, laicite, and it was um, extremized uh, in the Turkish application. And what happened was, um, the state was involved in uh, limiting the daily lives, the religious lives also of citizens. So in addition to their uh, lives as um, um, the parts of their identity, the ethnic identity, also their religious identity was defined and limited. How was this done? Uh, this was done uh, through unconstitutional applications like um, not allowing um, women especially because it is obvious those for those women who wore the headscarf it was an obvious uh, sign that they were uh, wanting to lead religious lives or it was a part of their religion. So the biggest discussion as I was growing up in Turkey uh, was the headscarf is a political symbol. Uh, so the state was defining what we the citizens were thinking. So a woman with a headscarf could say that no I'm doing this because it's a part of my religion, it's a part of my tradition, whatever I believe in, but she was told that no, this is a political symbol. I know what you're thinking. So the state uh, told us how we could talk, what language we could talk, what we could speak, uh, in what language we could speak, and also how much we could believe, how far we could go in our belief, and what our belief entailed. So this was an Orientalist uh, intervention of the Turkish state identity at that time. The system was such that. So a part of this, because it was visible with the headscarf for those women who chose to wear the headscarf, so they were considered as people who challenged the, especially the secular like, laicite uh, aspect of the state. So this was something that uh, needed to be stopped from the state's perspective. It couldn't be uh, it was never acceptable, it couldn't be tolerated because they didn't again fit the ideal citizen uh, perspective. Uh, how could the state deal with it? Through uh, discrimination. State uh, practices discriminated against women and uh, when we consider Turkish uh, population, right now we're 83 million, so more than half I don't know the exact percentage as of now, but it's always more than 50%. It's probably somewhere around 51% of these population is women. And from those women, according to official statistics that were given by, the, uh, by uh, official state institutions, 70% uh, of these women 
wear some sort of head covering. So uh, the system was built such that uh, there was discrimination against women, but this was done uh, maybe something similar we can borrow from the discussions, the narrative of racism from the United States. This one's done through institutional discrimination. So you weren't told uh, that you were not allowed in the university because of your religious belief, but because you couldn't enter through the outside gates of the university because of your dress code, because you didn't obey the dress code, uh, which was not on something constitutional. So you couldn't go to the university or you couldn't, in very, very extreme cases, you couldn't even get health services. Uh, the case of Medine Birjan is a case that's close to my heart. A 70 some year old uh, woman who's suffering from cancer is not given medical services uh, because she didn't have a photograph on, uh, the photograph on her ID had a headscarf on. It was a picture with headscarf on. So all of these things that are things that uh, happened uh, in Turkey. So it was an institutional discrimination against the women who chose to wear the headscarf. So the discussion for decades was um, the women who wear the headscarf are wearing it for a political reason and they are, by wearing their headscarves, they're pressuring, they're putting peer pressure on other women who choose not to wear it. Uh, but we found out that that's not the case. So when we look at the case of AK Party, in addition to Kurdish rights, Alevi rights and minority rights, religious rights, uh, headscarf is a very visible, visible, uh, visible issue. That's why uh, it's easy to talk about and visualize and um, give examples on. So when we look at AK Party period, we see that uh, the representation of women has increased. A lot of laws have been place, uh, passed that are, for instance, labor law that uh, gives, uh, gives um, women uh, equal pay. Uh, things that were not in the Constitution. Uh, for instance, in 2004, women and men are equal was put in the Constitution by AK Party. Also, state was uh, the, the phrase that state need to make, needs to make, is responsible in, in charge of ensuring that this equality is applied, was also put into the Constitution. 2010, affirmative action became a part of the Constitution. And how do we see that in the, in the for instance, in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey? In 2001, women representation was 4.6. Then in 2007, 9.1. I mean, it's still not where we want it to be. Like you said, uh, it's, there's a lot of the room to, to improve. In 2011, it was 14.1, uh, and it came up to 17.8. But also, uh, a number of things, other things took place. So by 2015, for the first time in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, women who choose to wear the headscarf along with men and along with women who don't wear the headscarf were able to come and serve as member of parliament in uh, the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. So this is something that was, that was not imaginable uh, even a decade before uh, because uh, this was, uh, this uh, women in Turkey, we are always so very proud of the fact that women's suffrage was something that uh, was established uh, before many, many European nations. So women in Turkey had the right to vote and right to get elected by um, 5th, of, 5th of December in uh, 1934. But unfortunately, when you look at it from the other uh, perspective, unfortunately, it is very, very, still very embarrassing for me to say that women who choose to wear the headscarf in Turkey only had the right to get elected in 2015. So that's an, that's an embarrassment for our history because it's our history altogether, uh, but that is, that is the improvement. So if, if we talk about my generation, something that's, uh, like I said, close to my heart, something that my grandmother had to deal with as a, as a wife of a military man uh, in, in 1900s, early 1900s, 
So a discrimination she faced, and later on my mother faced, she had to quit her position at the university after 1980 military coup, uh, something that my sister, my generation had to face, uh, like being removed from the Turkish parliament just because she wore the headscarf uh, and being removed from Turkish citizenship. And these are just examples. Uh, there's so many other examples that have such, such uh, dramatic stories. And then my generation and then my daughter's generation also, the, the uh, dif di discrimination they faced. And now it's as if we feel like it's, it's never happened. So when I speak with youth, uh, and I, we talk about these issues, they are like, when did that happen? That couldn't have been possible. So it is, it is, uh, that is another thing that I think AK Party brought. Maybe it is a part of our discussion. We're rewriting history or we're making amends of the state and the citizen, the people are making amends with each other. And uh, we see that how uh, we see the success of this. We saw it, for instance, during the coup attempt of July 15. I mean, Turkish citizens did something that doesn't fit any theory, uh, any rationality, any logic that we could think about. What did they do? They redefined the concept of standing up for democracy. Uh, they did it. All citizens from all walks of lives, uh, life, um, most of them maybe not even AK Party voters, by the way. So it, this is something that brought, I think, over the decades, the, the difference, the change, the transformation, the radical transformation in state behavior as a state that oppresses, from a state that oppresses to a state that is there to serve the people, uh, literally servant of the people. So that's one of the things that AK Party brought as well. The state is there as a servant of the people in every meaning of the term. Of course, this wasn't done just through talking. This was done through the laws and this was done through a fight. So there was, there was one step was put forward by AK Party and then there was, there was a reaction to it like party closure cases or like military e, e, e messages uh, with military intervention. But uh, these, these are the steps that needed to be taken. And at this point, we're at a point where just like our Kurdish citizens, Kurdish brothers and sisters, uh, the people who, are, who want to uh, uphold also or enjoy or fulfill the uh, needs of their religious identity are able to do so. This is something that we couldn't even discuss uh, freely just a few years ago. Now we're able to discuss it. We're able to criticize certain things. We're able to see what we can do to go forward and we're able to heal altogether. I think that's something very important that AK Party brought as well. One last um, thing that I also wanted to mention regarding women's rights, uh, one of the powers, uh, secret powers, I will say, it's not a secret, but important powers behind the success of AK Party is the work of the women's branch. And I'm not saying this because I'm a woman, but this is something uh, yesterday also uh, President Erdogan mentioned as well. So we have more than 4 million members of the, just the women's branch of AK Party. This is a number, as President Erdogan mentioned, that is more than uh, the total number of members of many other parties. So this is, this is, the, this is something that brought all the women who, are, who were maybe, maybe not uh, mobilized within the society, they weren't active. AK Party brought them out as a part of the political work, uh, also, but also uh, as citizens, because they had their increasing rights. A lot of incentives are given to women, for instance, who want to also raise their children at home. So the state support them, part-time pay, part-time part -time work. All of these things, for instance, didn't exist when uh, my daughter was born 23 years ago because I didn't have anybody to take care of her. I had to quit my position. So these are the things that touch the lives of the citizens like myself as well, and millions of other citizens. So I think this is something that, is, that has brought a good change for Turkey as well. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kawachi. You've given us a very thorough description and discussion uh, on the question I asked about both religious freedoms and rights as well as women's rights. Uh, I want to turn to Dr. Kishukshan and shift gears a little bit. Um, I think you're on mute, uh, Talib Hojan, Dr. Kishukshan. Um, so you've spent quite a bit of uh, time in Europe during your time as the member of parliament and you represent Turkey in various, uh, you know, uh, international fora, including mostly in Europe, but elsewhere as well. Uh, and you did mention European Union sort of membership talks, um, you know, that has its nature, very nature of that those talks have also evolved and changed and it's at a very different place now. Uh, and Turkey's relationship with the European countries have also been uh, redefined and reconfigured in many ways. Um, so can you kind of talk about your experience in Europe and how you interacted with your colleagues, European colleagues, friends, and what did you see there? What did you see about their perception, their understanding of Turkey and AK party that you represented? Uh, as you follow the discussions and debates on Turkey in the Western media or in the European uh, context, you will find that there has been a shift over there. Uh, before 2010, Turkey was described as a model country especially for the aspiring Muslim nations in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia. It was argued that Turkey was able to uh, combine uh, modern democratic values with that of Islam and uh, religion. Turkey uh, was a democratic country. It was a secular state. And there was a conservative government in Turkey, which was run by the AK Party under uh, President Erdogan, then Prime Minister Erdogan. And also Turkey was registering a very good economic uh, progress and development at the time, becoming the seventh biggest economy in the European Union and the 17th biggest economy in the whole world. Actually, when you look at the economic growth rate, it was the second after China in terms of the uh, past economic growth uh, of Turkey. Uh, not to mention all other you know, reforms that were touched upon by Hussein and Ravza in the democratic issues in the Kurdish area, uh, in Alevi issues. Also, there are some issues with the non-Muslim minorities that we might come to that later on. So the transformation was going on in almost every, I think, walks of life. And therefore, Turkey was described as a model country. But what happened in 2010, all of a sudden, those who describe Turkey and Erdogan as a reformist, as a uh, you know, great leader, uh, and uh, what we have seen in the Western discourse and rhetoric, that they have started describing Turkey as a country which has authoritarian tendencies, and Erdogan uh, is becoming a uh, more uh, authoritarian personality. I think we should focus on this. Why there was such a shift in the European context? Was it related to the developments within Turkey or was it something else? I think uh, this is something that I would like to touch upon a little bit because this is the area where I have encountered many issues. And Hussein said sometimes, you know, the images are more important than the realities on the ground. And this is the image which was created uh, for Turkey and for Erdogan. Uh, when we look at the uh, Turkish-European uh, Union relations, we will see a number of, I think, stages. Uh, in the first stage, European Union did not want Turkey to become a full member for several reasons. You know, partly those reasons were right, I think. They said Turkey did not have enough democracy. Turkey had a lot of issues with human rights uh, issues, uh, with the Kurdish issue, with, with language, with non-Muslim minorities, even with the majority Muslims, because the headscarf was banned, you know, religious freedoms were curtailed in Turkey because secularism was interpreted and applied in a completely different way than the US and uh, uh, the European context. Um, so uh, that then when the negotiations started or when the contacts started, the European Union asked Turkey to uh, renew itself, to uh, 
to reform its laws, regulations, and the constitutions. Therefore, 1982 constitution, which is the legacy of a military coup, has been changed over, over you know, time, time and again, almost, I think, 30 times. Changed. Yes, that constitution has been changed in order to become, let's say, more European, more Western in terms of you know, democratic values. And that has been registered, I think, positively with the, with, with the European Union. Uh, and uh, when our party was established, actually, there was a, I think, a lot of um, question marks in the minds of Europeans and Westerners, because uh, it was described as an Islamist party, though our party has never used that concept in order to define itself. But there was that image because Erdogan and his friends, they were coming from a conservative background, they were practicing Muslims, and they were using sometimes Islamic rhetoric and uh, I think concepts in their uh, political uh, projects and argumentations. Uh, therefore, they thought that when Ak Party came to power, they will give up the idea of uh, European Union membership, but that did not happen. I remember, I was not in politics at the time, but I was following the uh, issues. One of the first statements by uh, President Erdogan, then Prime Minister, was the fact that we never want to give up European Union membership. It is the other way around. We would like to become full member of the European Union because we would like to internalize the values, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we would like to, uh, let's say, um, bring uh, Eastern values. Middle Eastern values, Islamic values with that of the European values in, a, in, in such a way. That, that was the expression used by Erdogan. And in 2005, as you all remember, Turkey was accepted as a full uh, uh, candidate for full membership. Uh, and then, of course, until 2005, there has been, there have been a lot of uh, uh, reforms in Turkey in order to bring Turkish laws and regulations closer to the European Union. Uh, and that was also welcome. The Kurdish identity was recognized. Secularism has become more um, uh, Anglo-Saxon secularism, recognizing freedom of uh, religion, uh, etc. It was an ideology in Turkey before, uh, which we might come to that if you like later on. Uh, but uh, uh, Akpart has also, I think, transformed secularism, normalized secularism. Secularism became part of the lawmaking process in Turkey religion or the uh, Quran or the revelation is uh, not part of the lawmaking in Turkey. It's not a source of the law. It is completely a secular country. But when you look at the society, when you look at the sociological realities, there is a different picture over there. And all the politicians, I think, should or must take into consideration. And this is uh, something that Europeans, uh, I think, later on understood that Ak Party is not against the secular principles or the foundations of the state, but it was again is a restrictive, assertive, and hostile secularism. That is what Ak Party has, I think, changed over the over the years. Um, but later on, what we have seen in the European circles, the following, uh, I think, arguments and rhetoric. Well, Turkey has done a lot in terms of democratization, and it has corrected its human rights records. Economically, Turkey has also advanced, progressed, so we don't have this fear of immigration because that, that was also an argument in the Europe. If we accept Turkey as a full member, uh, you know, there, is, there will be a flood of people coming to Europe. Uh, and Europeans understood that this was not going to be the case because Turkey was developing in terms of uh, you know, economy, etc. But one issue, I think, came to the table in the European context, that Turkey has a different cultural identity. It was raised by the French leaders, later on uh, some German leaders, and of course, especially in recent years, more populist, uh, racist, and nationalist leaders in Europe uh, voiced this idea that Turkey belongs to not European values or the European family, but it belongs to, you know, Muslim civilization. So there is a civilizational gap between Turkey and the European Union. And also this was supported, you know, by some people later on, you know, this uh, idea of uh, clash of civilization, etc., etc. These sort of, I think, things also were uh, put into uh, this sort of uh, rhetoric. And uh, the image of Turkey has been uh, fundamentally, uh, I think, changed in the, in the European minds. If you look at many European, I think, 
uh, journalists today, uh, uh, the politicians, they recognize all the things that Ak Party has done in the past, but when it comes to full membership, we have seen the membership of Cyprus, for example, and there was a lot of problem within the Cyprus, and there was a division, there is a division within Cyprus, but despite the fact that there is a division, European Union accepted Cyprus as a full member. And when you look at many other countries, for example, Turkey and uh, Croatia, started full membership negotiations at the same time, and Turkey has done much better in many areas than Croatia, but Croatia now is a full member of the European Union, but Turkey is not. Um, I think these sort of uh, images should be taken into consideration, but one should go, I think, a little bit further than that, as Ravza had said in her, I think, opening speech, that Turkey started to um, defend its own interests at all costs. And especially during the Arab revolutions, we have seen a departure and a rupture between European Union policy and Turkey's policy because Turkey supported people on the street, their demands for democracy, their demands for representation, equal representation in politics. Uh, but the, we all know that uh, the United States of America, European Union, and many Gulf countries had a different position. And that was the start, I think, of rupture between Turkey and the European Union. Uh, then they started talking about Turkey becoming more authoritarian, Turkey becoming uh, you know, less democratic, etc. cetera. Uh, this is something that we had to encounter uh, in our, I think, uh, conversation with our European uh, counterpart. When it comes to Turkey's, for example, fight with uh, terrorism, they never recognized this is a right of Turkey to do that. They always looked at the issue from the perspective of PKK, when Turkey started this Kurdish opening issue, that's peace process, for example, that was unthinkable in the Turkish context. If you know Turkey, if you look at Turkish history, recognition of Kurdish identity, recognition of the Kurdish problem, and also negotiating with an organization through, of course, state channels in order to bring a peace to Turkey. And anyone who does this in other countries, they will, give, they will be given the Nobel Peace, uh, I think, uh, prize. But when Turkey did that and started uh, such a process, uh, it was welcome in the beginning, but later on we have seen that uh, some of the European Union countries openly, actually, some of the politicians, I am an eyewitness to this, they said PKK is not a terrorist organization, although European Union recognizes it officially as a ter terrorist organization. And also we have seen this uh, in the uh, coup attempt of uh, 2016 in, in, in Turkey. When you look at how European leaders reacted, it was a very weak uh, reaction. When they were supposed to defend democracy in Turkey and democratically elected president, they just waited until the dust settled. When they understood that the Turkish democracy is going to be the winner, its leader and the people supporting this uh, fight against the uh, coup plotters, they started, you know, supporting Turkish democracy. So this is, I think, some kind of double standard, uh, double standard that we should uh, be uh, aware of when it comes to uh, looking at AK Party from outside Turkey. Thank you, Professor Kuchukchan. Um, as as you said, the relations uh, with the EU countries. Uh, we have to understand the history of it, uh, I think, where we've come, uh, where we started and where we've come. And there's a lot of frustration uh, on the Turkish side, um, especially, like you said, the attitudes have kind of changed and many double standards have been applied. Um, so I want to um, turn to to a similar thing, but uh, Hussein, uh, you can talk about this you know, you address the Kurdish question and the PKK. Now there is in Northern Syria, as you know, the US has a relationship with the YPG, well, SDF forces. Uh, and then uh, I'm sure you're gonna complain quite a bit about double standards there as well. But um, strategically, how does, how does sort of, um, you know, to, like, like uh, Professor Kuchukchan talked about, Turkey started a peace process and uh, it failed for, for largely because PKK saw an opportunity in Syria, let's say. Uh, 
but how do you how do you think the AK party approached that uh, peace process? Why did set out to do it, and then how it evolved, and what do you think are the dynamics that caused its failure? Thank you, Kadir, for your uh, question. Uh, the the opening, the uh, the uh, you know the so-called Kurdish opening. Uh, was a process uh, uh, to, to finalize, to end the PKK uh, violence, PKK terrorism. For so long, uh, Turkey has struggled against the uh, PKK uh, separatist terrorism uh, exclusively with military means for decades, up until, up until the AK Party years. And then in 2009, uh, first, AK Party tried something new. Uh, it's also a first trial to, to have an indirect uh, negotiation, not directly with the PKK, but with some intermediaries to persuade the PKK elites to drop their guns, uh, to find some peaceful channel. Uh, because to be realistic, for those PKK elites, if you have no exit, no gate, uh, they will do this up until their death. They will keep, you know, uh, carrying out violent attacks in Turkish oil uh, in Turkish soil, up until their, you know, final end. So Turkey tried something new, something uh, untried up until that time. First in 2009, it did not work out, which we can uh, talk about why not. But a more serious attempt uh, was observed in the years from late 2012 up until the summer of 2015. Uh, in this three year period, uh, AK Party literally stopped uh, anti-terrorism operations on the condition that the PKK uh, does not carry out violent attacks in Turkish soil. Uh, and also the PKK corresponded, uh, the jailed leader of the PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, announced a ceasefire uh, in the name of the PKK. But then something uh, strange happened in the summer of 2015, when things were normalizing, when there was no more uh, violence uh, in the Southeast Turkey, when the life uh, got back to normal economically and socially in the summer of 2015, uh, with no motivation that we can know of, the PKK reinitiated its terrorist attacks. And also, uh, Talip Pichukcan uh, reminded us that sometimes images uh, become more important than the reality. Right now, the dominant uh, theme in the Western circles is that Turkey started its counterterrorism operations for no reason. That is the dominant position in Western circles. But in fact, it was the PKK uh, who pushed the trigger first. On July 20th, the PKK killed a Turkish soldier in Adyaman in the summer of 2015. Two days later, they killed two police officers in Şanlıurfa, Ceylan Pınar. And one day later, in July 23rd, again the summer of 2015, the PKK again murdered a traffic police officer in Diyarbakır. After these three killing incidents of the PKK, the Turkish government uh, gave the order to restart counterterrorism measures. And right then we saw the escalation. First, uh, the PKK announced that they will have this de facto autonomy in HDP ruled municipalities in Turkey. And then we saw this attempt for a rebellion in, in these towns and cities. And that's all happening in the summer of 2015. And eventually, since this is an asymmetric warfare, uh, the Turkish state is uh, way more powerful, literally speaking. Of course, the PKK lost this struggle, and the operations are still going on in, in a lower degree, and mostly uh, not in Turkey, but in Syria and Iraq, because uh, the PKK camps are located in Syria and Iraq, and within Turkey, there is not much activity going on after the summer of, especially the summer of 2015. Now, the question is, while everything was so smooth, while the PKK eventually found this opportunity for peace, uh, no matter what you call it, 
the lack of violence in other words uh, why they restarted reinitiated this wave of terrorist attacks in turkey that's a big question mark and i think uh, that was about the syrian conflict i think the pkk had this over uh, self confidence i think they thought that uh, with the with the american support for the pyd in syria with the uh, you know uh, regional developments while the many arab countries are on the edge of collapse in terms of uh, you know being a failed state i think they found this uh, as an opportunity and they thought that in this atmosphere we can achieve our goals by using military means terrorism tactics that was a miscalculation on the side of the pkk for sure and i think that was the reason why they uh, broke the ceasefire and attacked uh, the turkish soldiers and policemen uh, i think that's the uh, proper explanation but after a while the pkk changed its remarks the pkk said that we did not carry out those attacks in the summer of 2015 uh, but the problem is first the pkk accepted acknowledged that they carried out the attacks uh, and those remarks came from the top leadership of the PKK. And what I mean is Jamil Bayek. Uh, they said that we carried out the attacks against Turkish policemen in Şanlıurfa, for example. But after the defeat, uh, after their uh, failed attempt of rebellion in Turkey, they renounced those attacks and they said that no, that wasn't us, that was something else, that was the Turkish deep state, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, they acknowledged the attacks uh, very proudly but now uh, the pkk is denying their uh, first remarks on the matter so where are we then now right now the pkk's activity in turkey uh, is pretty much defeated right now uh, you don't see you know the pkk activism in turkey what i mean is you know terrorist attacks it's very very low the lowest in in the history of the organization but Turkey has changed its strategy of counterterrorism because the source of the problem is not in Turkey. For all these years, the PKK carried out attacks from its bases in Iraq and Syria. They infiltrated through the Turkish border. They carried out the attacks and with this hit and run tactics, they then escaped and went back to their bases in Iraq and Syria. And in order to counter uh, this terrorism attacks, Turkey uh, started this new safe zone strategy in Syria. So Turkey's operations uh, first uh, in Afrin in Syria, in uh, northern northwestern Syria, and then in the Rasulain uh, area in uh, the east of Euphrates River, it was Turkey's attempt to build safe zones for many goals. Uh, one of them was uh, to create a, a safe area for the return of refugees back to their homes. But one of the reasons was to create safe zones and also kind of buffer zones against the PKK infiltrations. In Iraq, uh, also Turkey carried out counterterrorism operations, Panche operations, uh, in the places that PKK calls the media defense zones. Because as you know, in uh, the uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, there are certain areas where the PKK de facto rules. And those areas are actually were right across the Turkish border. And the uh, central Iraqi military forces couldn't enter those areas. And also the Peshmerga forces of Barzani and Talabani, they couldn't enter those areas. And the PKK had this de facto rule in the so-called media defense zones. So Turkey started its operations in these zones. And right now, Turkey is sweeping PKK camps in an area from uh, Haftenin to Hakuk. And with these attempts, we are seeing a de-escalation in the PKK's capability to carry out attacks uh, inside Turkey. So this is the security dimension on top of what we discussed on the cultural matters, on the rights matters in the, uh, in the first round. 
this time I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Hussein, for your remarks uh, about uh, um, Kurdish sort of opening uh, effort by the AK party and how that process has evolved and how uh, what what sort of PKK's actions were on that. But uh, and you address some of the um, regional aspects as I my question was was also about Syria, so you addressed those, thank you. But I wanna move again back to a bit domestic politics. Now we we, we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Kawak, she, she's a current member of parliament, so our audience is asking uh, contemporary, uh, very um, sort of uh, contemporary questions as well. Uh, I'm gonna field uh, two of them to you. Uh, Dr. Kawakshi. Uh, the first one, as you know, there's been quite a bit of controversy recently about the uh, Istanbul uh, Convention. Um, what is your take on that? Um, it has been portrayed around the idea of, you know, human uh, women's rights. Uh, but, you know, as you mentioned, there has been a lot of progress on that front. So your opinions on that. And then also there's been, um, some former AK party uh, political figures have established their own parties. Um, there, are, There is most recently also Muharrem Inje from CHP that is now setting out to se establish his own uh, movement at this point. I guess he's gonna uh, establish a party as well. So what is, what is your take on those uh, sort of opposition parties that are formed or are or either are being formed thank you thank you dr Easton. before i answer the questions may i add something to the what our previous uh, speakers said uh, when uh, professor kuchukcan was talking about uh, the eu and turkey's role model status that's something close to my heart as well because that's i in my phd dissertation i talked about Turkey's role model status and the power relations within that from the EU membership uh, perspective. Uh, so that's something that's very important. One thing that I won't go into too much detail and bore everybody with the details of my uh, dissertation, but one thing that I wanted to add that adds to what uh, Professor Kuchukcan said, also what uh, Dr. Atkin said as well, uh, the double standards. We talk about the double standards that Turkey deals with when Turkey is protecting its borders, NATO's borders, all of a sudden, everybody starts talking about human rights. And the talk about human rights starts when Turkey's uh, fighting against PYD, YPG. So it's literally when Turkey's fight, fighting against terrorists, again, I mean, definition of terrorism, who defines terrorism, who is the terrorist, that's a big issue. So I won't go into that, but all of these things that Turkey deals with, there's a double standard. We cannot answer the question why Turkey is being in, held up to a different yardstick than everybody else. Uh, also, one thing with the EU is, you know that a European Court of Human Rights is a Council of Europe institution. However, it is also, its decisions are also respected by, by the EU. The European Human Rights Court never ever supported the rights of the women who wear the headscarf. So when we look at it from human rights perspective, women's rights perspective, uh, and that is a conclusion that came out of my dissertation as well many years ago, is that yes, EU uh, favors human rights, democratic rights, but those rights that are closer to European secular or uh, non-Muslim rights, I will say, and I will leave at that. So that's something interesting that Turkey deals with when it's Turkey who does an operation or who wants to pass a law related, related human rights in Turkey. And uh, when uh, Europeans, uh, used to and other Western nations used to criticize Turkey. They would criticize Turkey, for instance, uh, with relation to the rights of minorities uh, in Turkey and with AK Party, the, the lands, the foundations that belong to minorities, Christians and Jews and all the different religious minorities in Turkey. Uh, they were 
uh, they uh, were given back all their foundations uh, and uh, given back their rights in that sense. But that is something that EU was concerned about, but they were never ever concerned about uh, the rights of the Sunni majority women who wanted to wear the headscarf. So we have many cases related with that, but I won't go into, the, uh, into that discussion, so I'll be able to answer the questions. About Istanbul Convention, this is a convention that is uh, the Council of Europe Convention. It's called Istanbul Convention because it was signed in 2011 in Turkey at the Council of Europe meeting. And uh, it's a convention, uh, it's an action against violence against women and domestic violence. Once that, of course, these are like all other international international agreements, as uh, I had the honor of serving at the Foreign Relations Committee in the uh, Parliament uh, with Professor Kicip Can. Uh, so with, like all international agreements, in order for them to be made into a law, that needs, there needs to be a, a harmonization or a law passed within the national assemblies as well. So after that, we passed the law number uh, 6284, which is the law on protection of family and preventing, prevention of violence against women. There was a lot of discussion recently as well, a lot of discussion whether uh, in relation to Istanbul Convention, whether it fits uh, the, our, our um, values uh, of the Turkish nation, our Muslim values, our traditional values, different values that make up our society. So I think yesterday's speech, President Erdogan uh, made an important statement. Uh, I was thinking about the same thing. Uh, during our EU membership process, until 2005 and after that, uh, we passed all these regulations. It was a frustrating process. Turkey passes all these regulations, and then when it goes to the EU, it face, it's faced with a barrier when it comes to the discussion of membership. So it's, Turkey feels like since the signing of the, and going into effect of the Ankara Agreement in 1964, Turkey feels like it's, she's being kept at the door. So when, when um, during times of frustration, when we passed the, all these harmonization laws that were very good for our nation as well, so to serve our citizens, President Erdogan said something. You know, we call them Copenhagen criteria. Uh, we will call them Ankara criteria. We will still pass the new laws. So we, will, we can look into this convention from the same perspective. And yesterday's speech gave hints of that. So as Turkey, was, we're at a position where we can develop our own models, but also related with this convention, we can develop our own models and uh, give it to the service of international community as well. Uh, but with AK Party, the fight against violence against women has come to a level it didn't exist before, and we will never take a step back. So I don't think right now Istanbul Convention is relevant. What is relevant is a uh, fight against for the rights of women will continue and violence against any, any human being is not acceptable, will not be tolerated. So that is, that is the final uh, ex uh, answer on that. And other parties, okay, should I give a, I have many, not hats, but many scarves on this issue. So should I answer as a politician or as an academic, as a member of parliament, what do I do? Okay, as a, as a, as a politician and both as a, as a citizen, as an academic, uh, having different parties, the more the merrier. How much will they survive? It's difficult to say. But of course, uh, there are some parties that have leaders that I, we have worked with in the same parliament, under the roof of the same parliament. So um, when I look at what they're saying, uh, I do not hear anything new. But unfortunately, and this is, this is disappointing for me as well, as a citizen, as a member of parliament, as a politician, as an academic, is uh, that um, uh, I don't see, I don't hear anything new. Uh, I hear what I have heard so far, of course, we haven't 
I haven't listened to do too much in detail to what Mr. Inja has to offer, whether he will officially establish a party. But uh, from the other parties, existing parties that were newly established, I hear only one thing, and it's something that we have already heard many, many times. We're against AK Party, we're against Erdogan. They are bad. But I don't hear, I cannot hear what they have to offer. So I hear a lot of complaint. I hear a lot of resentment. I mean, these are emotional and technical. I hear a lot of criticism, but I don't, I don't see anything. Uh, I, I mean, when we're in, in political science classes, uh, one of the polit intro to political science, we talk about what is the aim of a political car party? First aim, I mean, as a member of AK Party, this was something that didn't, uh, I didn't believe in at that time, but that's what the textbooks say. The first aim of a political party is just to win election. But as a member of AK Party, now I think, of course, you have to win elections in order to serve the people. For me to serve the people is more important, but that's another story. But uh, I don't see, and unfortunately, I don't see that with uh, our main opposition, uh, CHP either. Uh, there is no, there is no demand to rule. There is no demand to to um, take the country to another point. There is a common demand, a, a unilateral demand, just to get rid of AK Party and Erdogan. So uh, the, uh, the new parties are also a part of that. So I find that uh, a little disappointing. Actually, I was thinking. Mm, what do they have to offer? Uh, we need, as, as, a mem as a politician now I will speak, as a member of our party, it's good to be a challenge. Let us, you know, we, we, we like to work, but we keep putting our own standards. We're the ones that bring the standard to a higher level. And we're um, literally um, struggling, or not struggling, but uh, we're, we're just, um, we're on our own in the field, racing against ourselves. Uh, but uh, so I do not see, uh, do I see it as a politician as a threat? No. And uh, we are the party who has made it um, difficult, uh, not difficult, but to have made, we have made it uh, possible for more political voices to be heard. Diversity is good. But do I see it as a politician from AK Party? Do I see it as a threat? No. No. So uh, I think it's good to have multiple voices. The more, the better. Uh, but uh, of course, it's the people who listen to it. So uh, I hope we don't bore them as politicians. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kavakchi, for those. Uh, we are running out of time. So I'm going to give a couple, last couple minutes to Dr. Kichukchan, Professor Kichukchan. And uh, as you know, <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Kawakchi just brought the discussion to that point, actually. He talked, she talked about the President Erdogan and AK Party, AK Party has been um, sort of um, identified with President Erdogan so much. Uh, there is very few examples uh, in, in Turkish modern history uh, a leader being you know, so identified with, with a particular party. And we can never obviously uh, ignore the fact that, you know, leadership matters, matters a lot. And in the history of this uh, party, um, uh, President Erdogan plays the major role, uh, the main role. And you've worked with him um, and you know that history. Um, how do you when, you, when you look at the leadership of Erdogan, um, I know that, that will take hours, but in a couple minutes, uh, what is your take on that, Dr. Kuchukshan? You're on mute again, sorry. Uh, Erdogan has been in politics for a long time. Maybe the, uh, the world community, the community outside Turkey uh, knows him since he became president uh, Prime Minister and President of Turkey, but the Turkish public uh, knows him since he became mayor of Istanbul. And if I want to describe him in a very short, I think, sentence, I would say 
he is a leader that delivers his promises. Uh, when you look at Istanbul, when he became uh, mayor of that big city, uh, it was in a, in a shamble. Uh, and over the years, I think he has done a lot in Istanbul that made him a, you know, a national celebrity later on. And when you look at the 19 years of, I think, Ak Parti leadership, again, he has been delivering whatever he has promised. And also, one of his distinguished, I think, character is that his um, uh, resilience and also his courage to challenge the status quo, both inside Turkey and outside Turkey. He has really uh, balanced civil-military relations in Turkey, a country whose democracy has been interrupted almost every 10 years by the military intervention. As we have seen on the uh, last coup attempt, he made a call to the Turkish people and Turks were out in the streets to, uh, I think, um, defend democracy. That made a history. In the previous times, we had seen other interventions, but we have never seen such a leader who would call upon the people to defend democracy. And also, as international, uh, in the international fora, in Davos, he said one minute to an uh, Israeli leader. That also made a history in Turkey and outside Turkey. And also he is challenging the uh, status quo of the United Nations. This is yet another, I think, example of his leadership, which I think brings respect, earns respect, both outside Turkey and inside uh, Turkey. Uh, and he is a charismatic leader. Outside Turkey, he is described as an authoritarian leader, but in Turkey, this is not the case. As we have described to you, you know, uh, he has started getting votes, 34% uh, ended up more than 50% today. And especially during the time of crisis, Turkish, I think, public has a lot of confidence in him, regardless of uh, political orientation. And if you look at, uh, for example, uh, the latest crisis, the COVID pandemic, uh, he enjoys more than 65% of uh, support in Turkey. That is a rare thing in the international, I think, fora. If you look at European leaders, if you look at the American leaders, there is a very, I think, different picture. And also, again, there was almost more than, I think, 70% uh, support uh, during the uh, coup attempt. His leadership was, I think, taken uh, very seriously, not only by the AK Party audience or the AK Party electorate, but beyond that. I think this is what makes him different from many previous leader and, uh, leaders and the current, current leaders, both inside Turkey and outside uh, Turkey. Thank you, Dr. Kichikchan. Um, I, this has been a very thorough discussion again, an hour and a half. Uh, we tried to sort of reflect on the 19 years of uh, AK Party, the ruling party in Turkey under the leadership of President Erdogan. Uh, we tried to address uh, both domestic and uh, international issues. Uh, I think we've covered quite a bit of ground from Kurdish question to religious freedoms to EU um, um, and, and the relationship with the US and the Middle East issues as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, our participants, our speakers, uh, Dr. Ravza Kavakci, uh, Professor Tarif Kuchukchan and Dr. Hussein Optik, and I, I want to thank you both, uh, all three of you, and I also want to thank our audience for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, complete this session here. Thank you. <laughs>